which is actually not a true. Uh, IVF is actually a great risk uh, to develop ectopic pregnancy. So studies found that there's actually 9.3 fold increase in the risk of ectopic pregnancy and IVF conceptions. And from here, people, they started to look into uh, other ways of improving or decreasing the risk of ectopic pregnancy in those who are undergoing IVF. So they studied day five embryo transfer compared to day three embryo transfer. They also uh, studied fresh versus frozen embryo transfer. And also they started doing PGTA and uh, examine if aneuploid embryos are more related to ectopic pregnancy compared to chromosomally competent embryos. So all of these questions can be answered today in uh, our talk and we'll go through them one by one. So if we look into this meta-analysis that compared actually day five versus day three embryo transfer. So this meta-analysis actually included 21 or 22 studies. And these included 143,000 pregnancies in which they divided them into day five embryo transfer and day three embryo transfer. And they found the following, a lower ectopic pregnancy rate was found in women undergoing day five embryo transfer than in those undergoing day three embryo transfer. This meta-analysis actually included too many uh, studies. Most of them were retrospective studies as usual, and only a few of them were randomized controlled trials. So what they did, they actually separated the randomized controlled trials from the retrospective trials. And they found the significant difference between day five and day three embryo transfer and decreasing the risk of ectopic pregnancy was maintained in the retrospective studies, but in uh, randomized controlled studies, this difference was not significant. That have been said, these randomized controlled trials were actually small. There are only seven studies and they lacked the power. So they concluded, uh, the present study indicates that day five embryo transfer reduces the risk for ectopic pregnancy in cycles that use IVF or ICSI compared with day three embryo transfer. It suggests that day five embryo transfer may be a better choice for decreasing the ectopic pregnancy rate and assisted reproductive technology. Further high quality randomized controlled trials are anticipated. So let's explain this. Why actually day five embryo transfer has less ectopic pregnancies compared to day three embryo transfer? Actually, we know when we stimulate patients with those uh, tons of hormones, it induces uterine muscle contractility. And the studies found that once we give the HCG, so once we give the trigger, the uterine muscle contractile wave moves from the cervix towards the fundus and it slows down until it reaches reach day seven after the HCG administration. So it reaches to a quiescent stage at that time. And that's the time actually when we transfer day five embryo. So we transfer at a time where the contractile effort is less. Another uh, reason to explain this is larger blastocyst diameter, which makes it more resistant to the contractile waves of the uterine muscles and higher quality of the blastocyst is more competent to implant in the right place. The other part that needs to be covered, which is associated with less ectopic pregnancy, is it a fresh, or a frozen embryo transfer. Again, we have this beautiful study in fertility and sterility that compared both fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles and the risk of ectopic pregnancy. And they found no difference in ectopic pregnancy risk for fresh and frozen third embryo transfer among those donor oocyte recipients. For those who are not doing IVF, donor oocyte recipients are not stimulated with gonadotropins. So the level of the hormones in, in their body is not as high. So those who group of patients, whether we transfer frozen or a fresh embryo, they have comparable risk of ectopic pregnancy. Whereas in the same study, they transferred fresh versus frozen embryos to autologous women. So autologous women in fresh cycle will be stimulated with lots of hormones and they have supraphysiological levels of hormones. Whereas if, they, if we transfer frozen embryos in those women, the level of the hormones are less because they are less stimulated. And in that case, they found that frozen embryos has actually less risk of ectopic pregnancy compared to fresh embryo transfer. And they concluded the following, 
the odds of ectopic pregnancy were 65% lower in patients who had a frozen compared with the fresh embryo transfer cycles. Perhaps this is related to the use of hormonal stimulation in the fresh cycle. Let's go through more explanation of this. The effect of suprophysiological hormonal level on uterine contractility or endometrial receptivity is a reason why uh, frozen is less associated with uh, ectopic pregnancy. Another reason is multifollicular ovulation and the oocyte retrieval procedure itself, which could contribute to both uterine contractility and release of implantation mediators adjacent to the tube, so will increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy. And the role of inflammation in ectopic pregnancy is also well known and could, could help explain the finding of increased odds of ectopic pregnancy in donor cycles in patients with endometriosis. The third, uh, and actually this is another study that compared frozen to frozen. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes we transfer frozen embryos to patients in their natural cycle, and sometimes we transfer frozen embryos in patients whom we prepare with hormones. And this study found that there is decreased risk of a frozen natural cycle frozen embryo transfer compared to hormonal cycle embryo transfer, which again will tell us the same conclusion. The more hormone, hormonal imbalance we have in our bodies, the more supraphysiological levels of the hormones, the more chances of getting an ectopic pregnancy. What about euploid or uh, chromosomally competent embryos versus chromosomally abnormal embryos? So, Secon et al. Uh, and IVF ET cycles reported a 60% decreased risk of ectopic pregnancy after IVF PGS, which means that euploid embryos are less likely to result in ectopic pregnancies compared to uneuploid embryos. Then they tried to explain it, and they said that uneuploid could cause delayed migration, abnormal trophoblasts are more active and therefore implant at an earlier stage, so they will implant anywhere before they reach the endometrium. And it has been reported that embryos with uneuploid fails to develop an extended culture to the blastocyst stage. And again, this will tell us if we grow the embryos more to day five, uh, the, the chromosomally competent embryos will only grow to day five and they are less likely to have abnormal implantation. The third part in, in, in our risk factors is tuber reconstructive surgery. And since Dr. Mariam is gonna talk about tuber reconstructive surgery, I'm gonna go only faster through it, we'll glance through it in three slides. So we know all of us that tuber reconstructive surgery has been largely replaced by IVF. And rates of ectopic pregnancy after tuber reconstructive surgery ranges widely from three to 30%. It's actually, it's actually a wide range, and this is because of the tubal status. We'll go through it in the coming few slides. The outcome depends upon the function and condition of the tube, type of surgery, and the surgeon uh, experience. So uh, this committee opinion from ASRM divided patients into good prognosis patients and poor prognosis patients. So those good prognosis patients, they have no more than limited foamy and next adhesions. They have mildly dilated tubes less than three centimeter with thin pliable walls and the lush endosalpings with preservation of the mucosal folds. For prognosis patients, I would say they have a lead pipe a tubes. And probably this is enough to explain it. So they will have dense adhesions, massively dilated tubes, thick fibrotic uh, walls, and sparse or absent lumen and mucosa. So they actually have rigid a tube that doesn't move and it doesn't look healthy at all. And we see it a lot in our population, especially that we have a lot of endometriosis patients in our society. So, and what they found in this, they found that intrauterine and ectopic pregnancy rates after new salping gostomy for mild hydrosalpinges ranges from 58 to 77%, and the risk of ectopic was from 2 to 8%. Whereas for if you repair a severe disease uh, a tube, you will have intrauterine pregnancy rate from 0 to 22%, and actually ectopic pregnancy rate from 0 to 17%. And there are too many studies that look into the repair of a damaged tubes, actually 
too many studies, we can't go through all of them in 20 minutes, but probably it's worth looking at the second study, a study which is a preoperative classification to predict the intrauterine and ectopic pregnancy rates after distal tubal microsurgery. And Mage et al. here, actually, they, they, he, uh, he gave an actually scoring system to the tubes. And this scoring system will give a tube a grade, a grade from one to four. And if we look at a grade one, they have a score from two to five. And these are actually mildly damaged the tubes or mildly diseased the tubes. And those in grade four, which have a score more than 15, will have actually bad tubes or severely damaged disease the tubes. And these actually depending on the tubal patency, ampullary mucosa, and actually the, the, wall, the thickness of the walls and maintenance of the mucosal folds. And what they, they did here, they compared the intrauterine pregnancy and ectopic pregnancy in those tubes that underwent microsurgery. So grade one tubes, so mildly diseased tubes, will have a 58% intrauterine pregnancy and 8.3% ectopic pregnancy. Whereas if you look at stage four uh, or grade four tubes that are damaged tubes, look at these, they have zero intrauterine pregnancy and zero ectopic pregnancy, which- Hello, Zakia. <clears throat> Maybe you need to unmute somebody. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So again, this tells us actually don't operate on uh, a damaged tube. There is uh, no reason for us to expose these patients to uh, prolonged surgeries, trying to do microsurgery, just to remove those uh, damaged mm -hmm. tubes. Then what happens? So the conclusion from these studies were a new salpingostomy must not, sorry, I have to minimize you guys, a new salpingostomy must not be proposed in selected cases according to tubal stage, adhesion stage, and the chlamydia serology. Chlamydia is very, 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 very important. If you found patient who is chlamydia positive, even if the tube looks okay, it's actually not okay. And when salpingostomy is performed, fimbrial aversion with sutures provides a slightly better result. I'm not going to go through that. It's just a way of explaining different surgeries of the tube, and it's not our talk. Uh, and then again, uh, other assisted reproduction methods is one of the important risk factors to develop an ectopic pregnancy. And it's the same mechanism, it's just because of the phys supraphysiological hormonal levels, whether you treat these patients with clomid or with letrozole or whatever it is associated with increased risk of ectopic pregnancy. Now, the other part of our presentation, I'm not sure if I went over time, uh, Ectopic pregnancy treatments in patients going for IVF, how do we treat these patients? Dr. Na'ma, you have, I will give you another two, three minutes. Okay. It's just worth mentioning, if the patients are going for IVF, new salpingostomy is not a question for us. We don't do it for those patients. Just forget it. Either we give them methotrexate or we treat them with salpingectomy. And here there's a comparison between methotrexate and sal injectomy, unilateral in patients going uh, for IVF, and they found that the treatment of ectopic pregnancy with methotrexate has comparable risk of recurrence of ectopic pregnancy following, following IVF with the unilateral salpingectomy. So if you do methotrexate or unilateral salpingectomy, it's the same risk of recurrence of ectopic pregnancies in those selected patients. And they are trying to tell you, patients who are going for IVF just do bilateral salpingectomy. It's actually better for them because there are other reasons why we should remove these tubes. Um, they found that those people would damage the tubes and hydrosalpingesis. Uh, mainly they have uh, a decrease in plantation and delivery rate by 50%, increase abortion rate by 50%, and possibly this is due to mechanical flushing of the embryos, direct embryotoxic effect or decrease in endometrial receptivity. So for those going for IVF, ectopic pregnancy, just do bilateral salpingectomy because this is their way of actually conceiving and forget about intrauterine pregnancy or natural conception. This is the last uh, section of my presentation. When we treat patients for ectopic pregnancy, whether we give them methotrexate, conservative surgery, or radical surgery, does this affect our future fertility? This is a very nice study from human reproduction. It's called the Demet randomized trial published in 2013. 
And what they did here, they divided the patients into two main arms. Arm number one, those with ectopic pregnancy that is less active. Arm number two, those with ectopic pregnancy that is more active. And how they divided these patients into these, they used what's called Fernandez score. This is published in 1991. And those, they have six criteria, gestational age of the ectopic pregnancy, baseline HCG, progesterone level, presence of tubal hematoma, hematotalpin, and peritoneal fluid. So if the patients get less score, less than 13, they will be in arm one, so they're more stable patient. If these patients get uh, a score more than 13, they will be in arm two, which means they need surgery. They're not a candidate for conservative treatment with methotrexate. So those with stay, who are stable, they randomly assign them to get either methotrexate or conservative surgery, which is salpingostomy with methotrexate. And those with active disease who needed surgery, randomized them either to get conservative surgery with methotrexate or radical surgery, which is the salpingectomy. And they followed them for 24 months and see what they found in 24 months. This is the kaplan meier fertility curve. They found after 24 months, there is no difference in fertility rate between those in the in arm number one who gets conservative surgery versus medical treatment. So there is no difference. And also in arm number two, those who got radical surgery versus conservative surgery, there was no difference in the fertility in the future. So whatever modality you use, you use it for the benefit of the patient. And our summary, assisted reproductive technologies associated with increased risk of ectopic pregnancy. Blastocyst day five produces the risk of ectopic pregnancy compared to day three. Frozen is better. PGTA can help, but availability and affordability should be discussed. And in patients who are candidate for methotrexate and who consider IV, who are not candidate, sorry, for methotrexate and who consider IVF as their sole method to achieve pregnancy, bilateral salpingectomy is advised for the reasons we mentioned. Different modalities of topic pregnancy treatment has no or minimal effect on future fertility. Thank you very much. Probably next time you need to give me an hour. I think so. I agree with that. Very interesting, very interesting talk. Well, um, uh, I mean, the, the, even the slides, very nice talk, Dr. Naama. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, you, we, we, we can do that next time, inshallah. Uh, so now uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if Dr. Fatima al Hanai listened to me, if she is ready. Or Dr. Salima? Hello, hello, Dr. Tismain al -Hain. Yes, I can hear you now. You can uh, you can share your presentation if you are ready. We are already introduced you to the uh, yes the audience. You cannot start screen share. We have the problem with screen share. Okay, so you want to. If can I need from Zakia or from the screen share? You cannot go to the share screen and uh, put, share your uh, slides through that again? الحين خلاص الحين, um, yes. Okay. Uh, I hope it's, I do, I, okay. Okay, very good. Look like uh, we are in. Can you now increase? Yes. yes. I think so, we can start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and sorry for the inconvenience. My, I hope my voice is clear now. Uh, I'm Dr. Fatma Al-Hinay, and I'm uh, giving this presentation on behalf of Dr. Jamila Al-Abri, who is unfortunately had, uh, has an emergency situation, so, so uh, I mean, prevented her from attending this uh, uh, webinar. The uh, topic is, as uh, Dr. Rahma uh, uh, I mean, uh, started with, it's an ectopic pregnancy uh, in Oman, prevalence and impact on maternal mortality and morbidity and mortality. My talk will include, a f uh, I mean, a few slides on the background, which already Dr. Nama uh, covered, so I will not spend more time on that. But the most important part is the statistics in Oman regarding the um, ectopic pregnancy. And also, uh, last, uh, and also I will end up with the way forward. As a background, uh, ectopic pregnancy as already defined is a pregnancy in which the implement implantation of the fertilized egg occurs outside the uterine cavity 
there are many risk factors, but the most important ones, those with those who includes previous history of ectopic pregnancy, tubal damage, assisted reproductive technologies, intrauterine devices, uh, prior pelvic infection and infertility. Others include um, advanced maternal age, smoking, and DES exposure. DES is um, is an abbreviation for uh, a synthetic form of estrogen that was used in pregnancy and now it's stopped. It's only used for cancer cases. Um, the incidence of ectopic pregnancy, uh, I found it it, uh, it is increasing worldwide and the overall estimates is one to two of all pregnancies and that is might be related to the increase in the sexually transmitted disease in addition to the increase uh, of uh, early detection rate. Um, the incidence is more when uh, among those who are using assisted reproductive technology. Uh, ectopic pregnancy it accounts for 10% of all pregnancy related deaths. And uh, since it is a life-threatening condition that uh, occur in the early um, uh, pregnancy, uh, it is important to uh, give an, a glimpse or an overview of the antenatal care in Oman. As, uh, as all of you know that antenatal registration is integrated in primary health care. So registration of all women is done at uh, primary health care facilities by trained doctors, nurses, or midwife. Uh, all uh, pregnant mothers will have a unique maternal health record, including all their medical obstetric history examination, risk for grading, current pregnancy information, and also any laboratory uh, test is done. In addition to the handheld uh, card, there is also uh, all patient visit will be recorded in, a sh in a, the electronic system. Uh, that connects uh, all the uh, different levels of uh, healthcare, uh, which make it easy uh, easier for uh, um, patient data exchange. The booking and dating scans are done at primary healthcare, while anomaly scans are done at secondary care. Uh, we do have also a well-structured referral system uh, where high-risk pregnancy are uh, uh, depends, of course, on the um, risk graining, which is done at each uh, visit. Uh, so high-risk pregnancy are referred to secondary and tertiary care for further management. To look to uh, the statistics, um, uh, we have the almost universal antenatal coverage reaching more than 99%. Uh, registration in first trimester, it is only 79.5%. There is a, a window to improve this. But and we can see that there is um, a slow increment in the uh, during the uh, past uh, years, uh, and uh, this area need uh, the improvement in early registration, of course, is uh, uh, is needed. If we compare the incidence of ectopic pregnancy in Oman, it took time for me to find the studies. Uh, I mean, published studies on uh, uh, on. Uh, the ectopic pregnancy, and there are many which is already conducted in, on a small scale. There are small scale studies. I mean, a small, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, sample side with, which is not representative, so it was not easy to compare. And also, the other studies used uh, a different denominator. Some used pregnancy, some used uh, uh, live births. But those the studies I could found. But despite all this, it shows that Oman had a high uh, incidence uh, of uh, ectopic pregnancy, uh, counted for 12.5 per thousand pregnancy. And this is based on the latest MOH data in 2000, for 2019. And this high rate is even higher than uh, some uh, developed uh, countries. But again, all these counted rates is only includes those registered in MOH uh, institutions. It means that it did not include those in uh, non-MOH institutions such as um, private or uh, other government uh, health uh, institutions, uh, non-MOH, of course. So there is a lot, there is a missing data here. So if those data were also compiled, maybe the rate will be higher than what is shown now. Um, and this is one of the limitations that we face always when we come and uh, to discuss discuss the maternal health uh, data. Uh, the, uh, the total number of ectopic pregnancy that was taken from the inpatient data, of course, again, MOH data, it account, uh, the total number is, uh, was 4,153 over the last uh, four years. 
But if we look to the, um, the number of cases barriers, we will find that the average number of uh, ectopic pregnancies barrier is around 1,000 cases. Uh, if we look to the uh, distribution of the ectopic pregnancy by the governorates, again, the, the accumulative number of cases of reported cases of ectopic pregnancy, we'll find that Muscat governorate had the uh, high number of uh, reported cases. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, because it's the, uh, the, the highly populated uh, governorate, uh, represent 28% of the total number of reported uh, ectopic pregnancy. Then it is followed by the uh, North Batina uh, constitute, uh, I mean, um, contribute for 18% of the number of cases and, uh, Dakh and then uh, Dakhliya uh, governorate. The other important thing that we need to notice uh, is that Buremi and Musendem, although they have lower number, but this is again, it might, there might be an under reporting of the uh, cases. The uh, Al Buremi uh, and Musendam are a border um, governorate, so there are some cases might be managed outside uh, the country and not. So no, the, the, their, those cases are, data are not included in the uh, in the uh, reports that is received uh, centrally at MOH. Further, uh, uh, I mean, um, sorry. To go in depth and see the percentage of ectopic pregnancy from the total uh, registered pregnant women across the governorates, we'll find that the uh, the percentage is almost uh, similar in most of the in all of the governorates except Al Wusta, which is around one percent. So the ectopic pregnancy is around one percent from the total registered uh, pregnant women. Um, the sites of uh, ectopic pregnancy, again, this is, uh, these are um, identified from the Shifa system using the ICD-10 code. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the mostly uh, coded uh, site for ectopic pregnancy is unspecified uh, site. Um, but again, we can see that the tubal pregnancy is also uh, uh, representing a high uh, a high number. I mean, this is uh, across the uh, four years that we included in our review. Now, if we want to see, uh, has, look to the, uh, if uh, I mean, ectopic pregnancy and its uh, effect on the morbidity and mortality, before I go to the data that we have, we have just to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, highlight the definition of maternal near miss and I, I'm sure that most of and all of you know about it but just a refreshment uh, it's a woman who nearly died but survived a complication that occurred during pregnancy childbirth or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy the other terminology that we keep in mind is the potentially life-threatening condition which is a clinical condition including a disease that threaten a woman's life during pregnancy and labor or after termination of pregnancy and uh, to, to, uh, no, because we don't have a previously any review of maternal near miss cases uh, in, uh, in October, between October 2016 and September 2017, Dr. Gamila took uh, a lead project where we, with the aim to introduce maternal near miss review to Oman to improve the quality of care. So a national a prospective cross-sectional study, including representative sample of hospitals where was conducted over a period of 12 months uh, to account for any seasonality. The total number of cases that were recorded during this uh, study, uh, there was 1,805. Of course, we we, uh, there was an exclusion of none potentially life-threatening conditions and those with maternal deaths. So the uh, so the total number of potentially life threatening conditions were 1,419, and the maternal near miss cases were 313 cases. Out of those, if we look to the ectopic, uh, for, I mean uh, the analysis uh, were to look to the ectopic pregnancy, uh, of course the uh, ectopic pregnancy under the group of pregnancy with abortive outcome. So the total number of uh, this group uh, as a B BLTC was 101, and 16 were there, were only uh, were only 
representing this, uh, where in where I mean uh, in the group of pregnancy with abortive outcome, which represent five percent of the total maternal near miss cases. Now, how we define how what was the the criteria or the markers to say this uh, the 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 ectopic pregnancy cases are maternal near miss, whether the case had a shock or blood transfusion or had a hysterectomy, if the case might have the three of these markers or one or two of, the, of those markers. And the maternal near miss cases out of the um, uh, recorded uh, 51 cases, seven only had a, a, a maternal near miss, uh, so which means 2.2% of the maternal near miss uh, uh, cases. Some characteristics of those cases that the identified cases is uh, the, um, uh, the the nationality. We'll find that Omani are morely recorded as uh, NMN, uh, maternal near miss. Uh, the age group there are this this it is distributed between the different age group. There is no specific age group where it, the, the number of cases increase. Um, uh, marital status. Um, it, uh, uh, for, five more uh, minutes for you, Dr. Mary. Okay, inshallah, I'll finish on time. Uh, educational background, it, again, on the higher, highly educated women, we are um, highly educated women more affected, uh, as we can see from the numbers. And Governor Ace North Patna was uh, on the top of the list where maternal near miss cases are more, uh, followed by uh, Muscat and then North Sharqiyah. Uh, again, if we look to the uh, gravida, uh, it, again, uh, we can see those who have less children have more, uh, uh, more uh, in, I mean, reported to have ectopic pregnancy. Uh, again, uh, though in, in the cases with, with no previous ectopic pregnancy, it is more uh, reported that they have this, uh, had a, an event of ectopic pregnancy. Assisted reproduction, mainly most of the cases were none. Uh, ANC booking, it happens mainly, I mean, recorded in unbooked cases. Uh, gestational, um, and then we, and because I have a short time, so <laughs> skip. Uh, sites, again, most of the reported cases were a fallopian tube uh, ectopic pregnancy. Um, others are ovarian, and other the, the third one was on the... Uh, as uh, the seventh, I mean, the last one was on the scar of uh, pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy, the presentation, mainly why it is there are NMA, uh, MNM, because uh, most of the cases had uh, presented with shock and only one had uh, hysterectomy, uh, one case. There is no blood transfusion in the uh, managed cases. Uh, management, uh, admission in ICU, most of the cases we can see they are not, there was no need for ad, uh, ICU admission. Admission in high dependency, of course, most of the cases. Uh, self -inject laboratory with salbingectomy was the uh, most common intervention that or management that was given to these uh, cases. In, if we look to the ectopic pregnancy and maternal mortality, uh, luckily uh, we have a cumulative number of, uh, we did, uh, I mean, from the reviewed cases by the National Maternal Mortality Committee uh, of the previous uh, five years, and we found only uh, one case that presented with ectopic, uh, ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Uh, was managed at a higher level uh, sec at secondary care, but the death occurred after laparotomy and salpicectomy on the fourth day. And it was found that uh, by a bedside echo, uh, after the patient deteriorated and arrested, that the bedside echo showed that she had uh, a suggestive, uh, the bedside echo suggestive of uh, pulmonary embolism. So that it was not the, uh, the, 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 the it, is, it was the ectopic pregnancy was the under lying cause, but it was not the leading cause of uh, the, the death in this case. The way forward, uh, actually, uh, there was, and to be honest, there was no focus on, on the ectopic pregnancy. And here I should thank the also for taking this opportunity and bringing attention to such an uh, important uh, uh, condition that needs uh, uh, to be focused on. Uh, in future, of course, when and in the coming health plans, we have we have to invest on the early detection. And early detection can be achieved by increasing awareness of physicians and 
uh, and uh, and patients themselves. The patients has to be aware of the sign, danger signs. I mean, the pregnant woman has to be aware of the danger signs and seek medical care. They have to do the early registration in the first trimester. Uh, also, we need to promote in this uh, in this area the uh, in, the uh, promote on the using of family planning, especially condom to avoid sexually transmitted diseases. The other part uh, in, with with the physicians awareness, we need to have uh, to continue the training in obstetric ultrasound, a project that was started in collaboration with Royal Hospital and uh, ISWAG. Uh, this is a very important and essential. Um, but for early detection. So by early detection, we will not only save mother's lives, but will also allow for using non-invasive uh, non uh, management more often. We have also to, ha to ensure readiness of our health system to manage emergency situations, uh, continue in providing uh, treatment, I mean, uh, training courses in obstetric, in emergency obstetric, uh, and also make sure that the treatment in the second in the referral hospitals are available across the uh, across the country. Um, again, because of the limited data, we have to think. I mean, uh, now uh, and and in we hope that we have more collaboration with OSOG and uh, to have a national data base so that we have a representative a national representative data and not only MOH data that we are currently uh, using uh, in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, health plans. What, because we rely only mainly now on the uh, available data by MOH without including those data from outside uh, non-MOH institutions. Um, this is it and thank you very much for your uh, listening. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fatma. Very interesting and uh, really, yani, I, I, those figures are really need somebody to go and analyze them further. Uh, thank you very much uh, for keeping us on time. Uh, Dr. Uh, Salima Wani, I hope you are uh, ready now. Dr. Salima? Yes, I am mute. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I just I need to see the share, share screen. If we close the previous screen, please. Yeah, sure. She will close it, Dr. Fatma. Okay. Thank you. Good. Now I'm going to share my screen. You know, I'm just getting, you know, some alerts here. That's why I'm not able to share. My screen is here. I don't know why you people are not able to see. I can see it myself. I, um, we are and I am able to share the screen. Let me see. Let me try again going out of this total altogether. Okay, I'll leave it and I'll log in again. Okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dr. Salima, maybe I can uh, go to another speaker. Or you want me to wait for you? Uh, I'm not sure. I cannot see now, Dr. Salim. I think she went out. Uh, Yes. Dr. Salima. Yes, darling. Since you just joined, uh -huh. open your presentation, but don't slideshow and don't minimize it. And I didn't minimize, it's open. And don't slideshow. I'm don't not, it's not, it's not on slideshow. Somebody needs to be there with you in order to find out the problem. Um, I think I'm just sharing screen, but not allowing me. 
or share your desktop and let's see. Let's see. Okay, that's better. Let me share the desktop. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. I log out again. If you want okay. to go to next Dr. presentation. Yes, I will go to another speaker. Uh, maybe Dr. Faiza, if she is around. Um, Dr. Salima, I think. Uh, yes, I am around. I, Dr. Salima, I think you need to follow the alerts that you get on your system to allow the system, to authorize the system to get access to your documents. I'm not sure if she can hear you now, Dr. Mariam, because she is out. Uh, oh. But now I think we will go to Dr. Faiza uh, till Dr. Salima manage the, her computer. Dr. Faiza Al-Fadil, she is a colleague, a colleague of uh, me, one of my best friends, so everybody says that we look similar. Okay, uh, Dr. Faiza, she is a senior consultant family physician. She's a head of women and child health in a primary health care in the uh, Muscat Governor. Uh, most welcome, Dr. Faiza, to be with us this afternoon. The screen is yours. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you uh, for my uh, for the invitation, Dr. Maria Shukri. Thanks for that, and Dr. Rahma and your group for the for the nice organization. Uh, my topic will be about. Uh, uh, let me share it with you. So it is about the impact of COVID-19 on the care of the early pregnancy. Um, is it clear? So you can see it? Yes. Yeah. So I will go through the, or the outline. It will be like, just briefly, I will mention about the importance of screening in early pregnancy and our routine antenatal care in primary health care so that you know the picture before COVID and then what is the impact of COVID in pregnancy what our action through Ministry of Health uh, and the uh, proposed guidelines and our action at regional level and dealing with COVID cases. So the importance of a screening in early pregnancy, uh, antenatal screening is really important for the health of the mother and the fetus. Uh, early registering into antenatal care is important for early detection of any comorbidities, proper management uh, and early management of pregnancy-related complications and for better outcome. So briefly about our antenatal screening, what are the things that we used to do? So after confirming the uh, pregnancy in the health center, initial assessment is done by the GP and antenatal uh, investigations are done. So blood test and the urine test, uh, um, that we have to know uh, if any high risk uh, uh, um, uh, pregnant ladies that we will know about it from these investigations. And usually we give an appointment for antenatal booking. Uh, ultrasound assessment is very important and it is used um, either, uh, we, we do it usually as an antenatal uh, uh, visit, but if the patient has presented late, like we prefer to do it in the first trimester, but if she has late, so we are asking even to do it before even booking. Uh, and this is because it is recommended for all pregnant women to determine viability and number of fetuses, gestational age, and its correspondence to the LMP date. And this will improve the consistency of gestational age assessments during pregnancy. So at booking visit appointment, uh, the, our most important thing is about the documentation in maternal health record. And this, uh, we call it also green card. And this card is very important in a way that uh, it is like a, co a, a communication collab collaborating between the gov other governors and the hospitals and the secondary and tertiary hospital. Uh, and we, we all document about the, all the investigation and the, uh, the follow-up of the uh, results. So this is briefly about the ANC service flow in primary health care. Uh, I will go through it because this is like, what is the routine we are, we are doing and then what we have done it after COVID. So usually the patient who is coming to the, uh, to the health center, she will register by the medical records section and they will direct her to the uh, triage of ANC room where their urine tests should, should be tested. 
she has to uh, give us a sample for the lab. And there is a waiting time for, for the patient so that till she uh, go to the antenatal room. There the midwife or the antenatal uh, nurse will ask the history about filling the data and the investigation in the green card and checking the vital signs. And then it will go to the doctor with, with the history and risk assessment and examination part and uh, investigation if needed. Further investigation like uh, GTT, for example, if the RBS was high or FBS. Uh, obstetric ultrasound usually is done in a uh, health center. It depends on the health center. Some of the health centers, they will do it in the, by the radiologist uh, in the radiology department. Uh, I mean their x-ray room and some are, are doing in the antenatal. And those who are anemic, we will send them to the dietitian usually for uh, counseling. And then we will guide the patient to go to the pharmacy and take her medication. So usually this process takes around two hours. And this is the average, depends on the um, crowd in the health center. So uh, what is happening? Usually our, our things are going smoothly, but COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, what changes has been done? What is the impact of the pregnancy? Uh, um, so if we can say that the impact of COVID on pregnancy, we don't know. Is it related to the patient that there is no, no harm and she, can, she has low risk and she can continue her uh, life? Or she may have some complications and she needs more of intensive care uh, management. Um, well, the, uh, from the studies globally that there is a limited data of COVID-19 during pregnancy because we can see that all countries will say the total number of uh, cases and they will not mention about the uh, specifically during pregnancy, but we have selected some of the studies that has been done. This is in UK. They have revised 55 studies from 16 countries regarding the uh, hospitalized woman and what is the risk of uh, uh, complications. So the, the, the woman who can get uh, hospitalized while lower than the general population. This is in the updated in September, 2020. And some of them were asymptomatic. Uh, on the other hand, other studies from WHO uh, have uh, uh, reported that they found that the pregnant women are at an increased risk of getting severe illness of COVID-19 and are more likely to be admitted to the intensive care unit and are uh, at increased of maternal death compared to the non-pregnant woman. So these findings might be related to physiological changes in pregnancy and uh, some kind of immunity, and including increased heart rate and oxygen consumption, which decreased with the lung capacity and there is an increased risk of thromboembolic disease. Um, regarding the impact of COVID on early pregnancies versus late pregnancy. So our concern about early pregnancy, does we have, do we have any data for that? Uh, other studies have documented that the risk of pregnant ladies who appear to, in, uh, it in, to increase, especially during the last trimester. However, early pregnant women who have risk factors such as if their age is more than 35 years, if they are overweight or, overweight or obese and have pre-existing medical uh, uh, conditions, comorbidities like diabetes, so they are at an increased risk of developing severe complications of COVID-19. What about the data of confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Oman? Um, I have taken the data uh, regarding uh, the, we can see here, uh, total number of in Oman, but I have taken till August because of the definition uh, of the uh, lab confirmed test, it was still mid of August and then the, the test, uh, the, the definition has been changed. So about total of uh, total uh, cases in general in Oman were about 85,000 and more. And the total number of pregnant ladies in Oman, uh, it was 769. And in Muscat region, I mean, in Muscat governorate, we had, this is the total number, uh, about 41, which is almost 50% of the total in Oman. And the number of pregnant in Oman were a total of 272. And we can see that uh, we were doing very well during the, uh, in the beginning, but the cases have been increased till uh, 12 uh, August, uh, 2020. Uh, so what is our, what we have done? 
what is the Ministry of Health uh, action for this uh, case of pregnancy? So they have done uh, guidelines uh, regarding COVID-19 in pregnancy. And the main aim for that was to standardize the service provided to pregnant women with suspected confirmed COVID-19. And in general, we can say that advices regarding obstetric services, uh, that the care of pregnant women is very essential service and should not be stopped and should be continued. An appointment to be deferred for 14 days for women who, have, uh, who are in quarantine period. Uh, and uh, the general advice for healthcare professionals, we have asked them that the, to attend the antenatal as per appointment time given. Usually we are giving them the, the day and they come as numbering and we take them, but the appointment time sh should, be evaluated, uh, should be highlighted. And pregnancy with low risk, consider reducing the number of antenatal visits which were from, um, from six to four. Uh, but in cases of high risk, they have to be followed in secondary and tertiary facility. And we have to advise the all pregnant women to follow the protective measures to reduce the risk of contracting any infection during COVID-19 and by avoiding the contact with suspected case of COVID-19 and social distancing is very important. Avoid going to places which is not necessary. Physical distance of two meters uh, is, um, is important especially those who are at 28 weeks of gestation and above. And for women who are uh, self-isolated uh, at home, which are suspected of having COVID-19, uh, COVID so they have to be ensured that they are well hydrated and are mobile because mobilization is very important to reduce the risk assessment, to reduce the risk of venous thromboembolism. And if there is a risk of you know, uh, thromboembolism, a score of showing of three or more, then the prophylactic of low molecular weight heparin should be recommended. Okay, coming to our regional level uh, in Muscat Governorate. So based on MOH guidelines, we have simplified to the GP um, about the points that we have been uh, discussed in way of flow charts that I will show you later. And other thing that we, work, uh, we are planning to reduce the waiting time as a part of lead management and introducing telephone consultation and provision. Uh, we have managed to provide uh, the low, uh, low molecular weight heparin in polyclinics, which was not available before. So this was the, the simplified flow chart that we have done it. And uh, it is bas basically, we can concentrate on uh, what we have done. We have done filtration disk. So when you enter the health center, it will be like in front of medical record section, there will be a filtration disk where they will ask about the symptoms of uh, ARI symptoms. So anyone who is having some symptoms, they will go to the other side, which is the isolation room, and they will be assessed there. And those who have an appointment, uh, they have no, uh, no ARI symptoms, then they will go to their appointments. So our pregnant ladies, we can go to the other side to show you that if they have no symptoms, they will go, this is just to remember about the diagram. So from the filtration disk, okay, they will go directly to the antenatal room where the nurse will help him in registration instead of going to medical record. And then even the urine sample, we are asking them to bring it from home. So it will be easy instead of sharing the public uh, toilets. And today she will check the vital signs and the doctor will be in the same room and uh, the assessment part from the doctor will be there. The ultrasound machine, we have kept it in the room, so there is no need to go and come. So it will be done in the, the viability scan will be done in the ultrasound room. Counseling also it will be given initially and the protection measures. And uh, if need is for the dietitian, it will be arranged by telephone consultation. And medication also, we are not going to the pharmacy. They will take it from the room. And uh, it will be like flexible. We will put them the like folic acid or fipol will be ready in the, in the room. So we have minimized the waiting time instead of two hours or more to less than one hour, which is really uh, a, a good achievement. Um, in case of those who are going to the isolation room, uh, I mean, uh, they will be uh, actually before they were swabbed uh, for, to, to confirm if they have COVID or not. So if it is negative, they will follow the infection prevention and they will be given an appointment after they feel uh, better. But if they are positive, then we will ask them to, will, uh, to go to uh, 
uh, this is the second flowchart that we will go to the home isolation. They have to be isolated at home. Assessment should be done the, on, on daily basis, but the first assessment will be done by doctor because it's very important about the uh, by telephone consultation. It's very important to assess the risk risk grading and uh, venothromboembolism risk assessment in addition to the advices that we have to tell them that I have mentioned before. So those who are coming in early pregnancy with low risk, usually we delay our, their- Five uh, more minutes, Dr. Kaiser. Excuse me? Five more minutes. Yeah. And uh, those who have some, uh, we are uh, following up daily and those who have mild symptoms, uh, they can be managed by phone and then any one of the relatives who are uh, not having COVID, they can go and uh, take the medication directly from the uh, um, pharmacy in the health center. And those who have more of uh, needs intervention like threatened abortion, they need a scan. It is arranged by end of the duty because of the uh, infection control safety. And those who have symptoms suggest of urgent intervention these are being uh, reported to a uh, contact by the specialists and uh, to the hospitals, and they can go directly there with a good arrangement and good uh, uh, cooperation really by hospitals we have faced. Uh, what challenges we got it? We are maintaining, uh, actually we are maintaining early antenatal booking. Uh, um, um, it was difficult actually maintaining early antenatal booking because uh, some of the, uh, women who are a bit afraid to come to the health center and because of lockdown period. And so there were many defaulters. So they have ended up to be late booking. I mean that they were in second trimester, but we were trying to contact the defaulters and we ask them, even if they are in the peripheries, other government late to go and seek their advices there because it's very important for their health. And some of them, we got delay of GTT investigations and because sometimes it is indicated in early pregnancy, but because they are not coming for follow-up or there is a, a, some of the delays because of if they are in the isolation period. So this is mainly the challenges, but we are trying to overcome this. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, we are doing very well now. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Faiza. It's really very nice presentation to know what you all people doing. Uh, you are doing really a great, great job. Um, now, We'll go back to Dr. Salima. I hope you are ready now. No, no. Uh, Dr. Salima, you can unmute yourself. Yes, I'm unmuting. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So, Dr. Salima, you have 20 minutes. Yes. Thank you. As per that, it was 30 minutes. Anyway, I'll try my best to be fast. I'm sure. going to talk about VT prophylaxis during pregnancy and postpartum period. Next slide. As you all know, we were just now saying what is important in thromboprophylaxis or thrombosis or VTE is to keep the eyes open for thrombosis because this is one of the leading causes in pregnancy, especially whether it's during pregnancy or postpartum. We know the pregnancy, during pregnancy, the risk may be fourfold higher, but the most risky part is the postpartum period, which can go up 60 fold higher. Next. Uh, these are my some of the objectives which I want to cover. The main thing which I want to cover, why we all need to think of thromboprophylaxis, what is the effective management, and already beautifully has been covered by Dr. Faiza about the COVID-19, and I'm just going to give the, some recommendations which have been, and some take-home messages. Next, please. Next, please. Next. As I said, is a leading cause of direct death uh, during pregnancy. The overall case fatality rate of it is about 1% during pregnancy. But if it happens a pulmonary embolism, it can go up to 3.5%. And most of the DVTs which happen during pregnancy are not only proximal, they are larger, and they mostly happen on the left side. And about 70% of the DVT happens on the left side. And that explains by the anatomy, that is the compression of the left iliac uh, by the right iliac artery. And the challenges are 
whenever these patients come, the symptoms overlap a lot between a normal physiological changes of pregnancy and the DVT. So the diagnosis, patients come and go, the diagnosis does, is not made, the prevention is not applied, and the treatment also is a challenge because you have to consider both the mother and the fetus. And there is a, one of the biggest problem is we have a lack of high level data on this availability on the thromboprophylaxis in pregnancy. The next is that uh, we need to think of what we see as a P or DVT is an end of a spectrum. The mortality is the tip of the iceberg. What's hidden behind is a lot of morbidity which these patients undergo. We know only 20 to 25% of all VT events may manifest in P. That means 75% and above can have some other uh, VTEs which are not leading to pulmonary embolism or mortality. And these patients suffer with a long-term uh, morbidity, which is short-term as well as long-term morbidity, and it does have a lot of financial consequences. And because of that, it's very important to have an effective prevention, which is the initial step. As we all know, prevention is better than cure, than diagnosis and treatment. It should be priority in all healthcare services worldwide. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an embrace report. I always love to present it because it gives us an insight to what's happening in the developed world. And this comes from the UK, as we all know, it's a triennial report. Next, please. Uh, if you see the second leading cause of death, first leading cause is thrombosis and thromboembolism due to direct maternal mortality. But if you take overall mortality in UK, the leading cause is cardiac disease, which mainly becomes the indirect cause of the death rather than a direct cause of the death. Next slide, please. Uh, I think if you all remember, we had the first guideline which came from RCOG, that was in 1995. And what we saw is a tremendous fall in the deaths, which was mostly post cesarean section patients. And then it started again going, what was problem was the postpartum patients were not covered. So the new guideline came, which was covering the postpartum patients as well in the after vaginal delivery. And that guideline was published in 2004. After that, again, another decrease in the drop in the number of deaths due to VTE. And there was another guideline introduced, which was 2015, which presently is the last guideline available. But again, what has been seen in last 20 years, there has not been a significant drop in the mortality to do to VTE since 19, since 2009. That's quite a sad news. And next slide, please. Uh, if you go to the last report, 37 deaths were due to VTE. Of that, 35 cases died because of the pulmonary embolism and two due to cerebral venous thrombosis. And of them, the most important thing to remember is the postnatal period. There were 20 deaths of these, 37 due in the postnatal period. And the cesarean section was the main problem. And that was 14 cases died because of the cesarean, post cesarean section because of the VTE and pulmonary embolism. Next one, please. That's what I was saying. It's not the period, any period is immune for not having a VTE. It can happen any trimester, whether it's the first trimester, second trimester or third trimester, but the postnatal period is the major problem and it can extend up to six weeks. Even now the recent reports are coming, even it can be up to three months, but it may not be the same as in the number week two or weeks, uh, week two to week four, but they are still a significant risk of having VTE during this period. Next slide, please. What's important to see, did these women receive adequate care? Was there anything which could have been done better and the outcome would have changed? And what in 68% of the cases, there was an opportunity to improve the outcome. That means we missed their risk assessment. We didn't give them strong prophylaxis and that became a problem. And this is not only in the U UK only, what happened in US, the same CMQCC quality, uh, project, which was from California, say, showed the same, that 52% of the patients had good opportunity to alter the outcome, whereas there was a provision of improvement in about another 45%. So still a significant number of the patients undergo, uh, they develop thromboembolism or they die because of the thromboembolism because we didn't take appropriate care. There was an opportunity to, to improve the outcome. Next one, please. 
And this is the same representing that window thromboembolism, the SAMP standard care. Next one, please. What were the possible reasons that there has not been a persistent decrease in the number of deaths? There are some population-based changes and these are women are now more older. They get pregnant when they are more obese as well. They have more risk factors. And as we all heard about the assisted reproductive technology, any woman can get pregnant now with the more interventions. So likely in future, we are likely to see more patients with greater problems. And there is a focus that we should be attending more to the attention to the prevention. And the three important risk factors which they found during the last triennial report, next one please, was that there were three things. One was that the people were not given appropriate doses or they missed the dose or the review was not done in time. And we all know why the risk of ET during pregnancy is increased. There are all four elements if you look into the uh, with cost tri triangle, the main thing is the hypercoagulability, that's coagulation factors are increased. There's a decrease in the amount of natural anticoagulants, which is protein C and protein S. And there is venous stasis, which is because of the venous capacitance decreased venous capacitance and obstruction of the inferior vena cava due to gravid uterus. And there is also vascular damage, which mostly happens either with difficult vaginal delivery or post cesarean section. Next one, please. This is, these are the bigger agencies which tell us how we should be making our patients safe. And it's Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, whether it's JCIA or it's a National Quality Forum. All of these three major uh, agencies are recommending one thing that number one patient safety practice for the hospitalized patient is to assess the VT and to give them thromboprophylaxis if they need. Next one, please. This is another one, which is from the Council on Patient Safety. What they did, they did a very beautiful, divided it into safety bundle into four elements. The first thing is that we all should be ready. That means we should have assessment risks. And the second one was the recognize and prevention. Recognition is when you do the assessment, having the systems, which are very easy to do in the hospitals, and then to apply and increase the education of the patients and as well to the physicians or healthcare providers. Then to give the appropriate thromboprophylaxis, whether it's a mechanical, which usually doesn't really work. So you need to give the uh, pharmacological thromboprophylaxis. And the last one is, if there is any VT event in the hospital, you should have a reporting system, analyze those cases and find was there any opportunity to improve. And that's for learning purposes. Next. Um, what we are subject today talking about is the ectopic. One of the major problem in the last triennial report was that we didn't give uh, thromboprophylaxis to the women who had miscarriages or who had ectopic or any other surgery during pregnancy. And that's what was not covered. And that's why there is a lot of focus that these patients who undergo any surgery during pregnancy should be given thromboprophylaxis. And again, we need to have the assessment of these patients, not once, rather we should be doing at booking, then reassess whenever they get admitted. Or if any patient is getting immobile for any reasons like fractures or anything, to assess them and to give them thromboprophylaxis, or if they have any surgery or any trauma, please make sure that they have an assessment and they are covered. And that's what's important safety bundle for the patients. Next one, please. We know that these risk factors can be divided into three important elements. One is the pre-existing risk factors, then you can divide them into obstetric risk factors, or you can have transient risk factors. Pre-existing risk factors, somebody who has previously had venothrombiabolism, or she's known case of thrombophilia, or she has medical comorbidities like heart failure, not any other heart lesion. It's basically a heart failure, or they have cancer, or nephrotic syndrome, or inflammatory bowel disease. Or if they have a family history of unprovoked VT, or their patient's age is more than 35, we can't change it. Obesity more than 35 BMI, or she is para three, or a smoker, or she has gross varicose veins. Obstetric risk factors, which can increase the risk of VT or preeclampsia, assisted conception, especially with the multiple pregnancy, birth by cesarean section, difficult forceps or rotational forceps, prolonged labor more than 24 hours, hemorrhage, 
blood transfusion, preterm birth, or stillbirth in the current pregnancy. What are the transient risk factors? Is the one like surgical procedures, whether it's an appendectomy, sterilization, or ectopic pregnancy, or even an ERPC. Hyperemesis, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, or any systemic infections, like if they get admitted with hyperemesis, or they have any dehydration, or they get admitted for any reasons to the hospital. Next one, please. So as we all know, as we are practitioners, we know almost 90% of the women who develop in PE during pregnancy did have these identified risk factors as per as the, all the embrace reports, if you take it from any time, the women did have the risk factors and they were not taken care of. Next one, please. This is a very interesting slide, which is about the mega study. And this study was done in the Netherlands. What they did is a very prospective long-term study in which they looked into uh, patients who have delivered and what was their risk factors. So they checked all of them in comparison to the controls. What they found the risk factors, one, they, the risk of VT in the postpartum period is almost 66% fold higher than in comparison to the other patients. And this continues even up to three months. And the next slide, please. And they looked into three different elements, whether it's a DVT, whether it's a pulmonary embolism, or it's a combination of DVT and pulmonary embolism. All of them are associated with increased risk of having uh, postpartum DVT more than antenatal DV, antenatal uh, during the antenatal period. So the postpartum period becomes the most risky period, which most of the times may not be covered by thromboprophylaxis. Next one, please. So this is, what is the risk if a patient has a preeclampsia? Is it preeclampsia alone or preeclampsia associated with IUGR? If anybody has preeclampsia and IUGR, the risk is about 5.8 fold higher, almost six fold higher. If she has no preeclampsia, but she has an IUGR, it's about three and a half fold higher. If she has preeclampsia, but no IUGR, the risk is again 3.5, one fold higher. What about antenatal immobilization? Immobilization during pregnancy is the bad news, especially if they are more than BMI, more than 25, and they are immobilized, the risk can go up to 40 fold. Next one, please. And this is postpartum bleeding. Again, the odds ratio, if a patient bleeds, if any woman bleeds more than 1,000 mils and she has undergone a surgery, and that risk goes almost 12 fold higher. Next one, please. And stillbirth, the risk goes up to 5.9 fold, which is almost six fold. Transfusion about nine fold. And then if a patient has active lupus, almost nine fold higher risk of having VTE during pregnancy. Next one, please. These are about thrombophilias because every thrombophilia is not same. So you can divide these thrombophilias into low risk thrombophilias and the high risk thrombophilias. The high risk thrombophilias are factor five laden homozygous, homozygous pattern, prothrombin gene mutation homozygous, or if they are heterozygous means prothrombin gene heterozygous and factor five laden mutation heterozygous, which is the mixed thrombophilia and antithrombin-3 is the worst because the risk of having VTE with antithrombin-3 deficiency can go up to a 40-fold higher. Next one, please. This was a study which we did in the Gulf region and as well, Oman was participating in this study. So we looked into what were the risks, do we have risk factors? Because one of the, always the point which most of the people say, oh, in uh, Gulf region, the risk of VTE is not high at all, but we did that does it happen reality? The majority of the patients in Arabian Gulf have a risk factor for VT, at least one. Even though they had more than three risk factors, they were not appropriately covered with thromboprophylaxis. Uh, if you go to the guidelines and what it is, if anybody has more than uh, two risk factors and uh, they are more than 28 weeks pregnant, they should be given thromboprophylaxis. So as per that, majority of our women are para three, with a BMI of 30. So definitely they fall into a risk factor of two and they need, or three, they need to go for a thromboprophylaxis. Next one, please. And what are the patients which will define the extremely high risk are the patients who have four points. Those are 
patients who have previous venous thromboembolism, which is not related to the surgery, or a patients who have ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but this is mainly limited to the first trimester. Three points are patients who have previous venous thromboembolism, but had a following a surgery, or they have known high-risk thrombophilia, as I said before, antithrombin deficiency or prothrombin gene mutation, homozygous or factor V laden mutation, homozygous or heterozygotes or both. Any surgical pregnant, any surgical procedure during pregnancy is a risk factor and they gain just straight away three points. Patients who are admitted with hyperemesis, which sometimes can be ignored and they can develop VTE and medical comorbidities, all of them which are inflammatory bowel disease, systemic lipid erythromatosis, cancers, heart failure, and nephrotic syndrome during pregnancy are extremely high risk. And I think I'm sure in Oman, you have a lot of sicklers and that is a high risk for developing PTE. And we don't have intravenous drug users, but we have the problem of sicklers in our part of the world. Those who are two points are patients who have a cesarean section in labor or obesity where there's BMI more than 40. And these are the patients who straight away score of two points. There is a huge list of where there is one point. If you join those one points, you might easily reach to four or five uh, scoring points for VTE. Next slide, please. You can take it from known low risk thrombophilia, age, obesity, parity, smoker, preeclampsia, reproductive technology out of three months if they didn't have any ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, mid cavity rotation forceps, prolonged labor, all of them score one point. If we join all these points, we might reach seven, eight, six points without any other risk factors, without having any VTE in the past. Next slide, please. This is, does um, hospitalization make a difference in the outcome? There were two cohort studies which were published in 2013 and 2014. What did they say that the risk of, if the patient stays in the hospital for more than three, time, three, three days, her risk of having VT is about 18 times higher. And if she stays less than three days in the hospital, still she has a four times risk of having VTE. So whenever these, any pregnant women whether low risk or high risk is admitted to the hospital. It's very important to stress on importance of mobilization, avoiding dehydration, giving sequential compression devices, and to use low molecular weight heparin in these mothers. Next one, please. Uh, this is another, does BMI make a difference and the weight gain during pregnancy? You might have seen some of the patients who gain at least 20, 30 kilos during, pre -preg uh, during pregnancy. Pre-pregnancy BMI has a linear relationship with the risk of postpartum VTE. And BMI of more than 30, the risk can go up to fourfold. But if the patient has more than 40 BMI, the risk of can be much higher than fourfold. So the weight gain, anybody who gains more than 22 kilos in pregnancy, her risk of having VTE during pregnancy is about 1.5 fold higher. Next one, please. This is, does may, mode of delivery make a difference to the uh, pulmonary embolism in the postpartum period? If you take the top one, the top uh, graph shows the risk of having VTE if a patient has a cesarean section. And the lowest one is the one if they have normal delivery in between is where there is everybody you put them together, the risk of VTE. And does this risk of VTE continue? Yes, the highest risk is between week two, week three, and week one, but this continues even up to 12 weeks, even though it goes lower, but it doesn't come to the zero. And again, the risk is higher in the patients who have a cesarean section in comparison to the vaginal deliveries. Maybe the newer data will show some alterations because we are not keeping these mothers anymore, more than 48 hours in the hospital. The moment they do have a cesarean section, they are discharged on the second day or max by third day morning. Next slide, please. So how long duration of the postpartum uh, risks continue. As I said, they can go up to three months. Next one. And this is evidence from this, which is a very interesting uh, 
you know, publication and has been quoted in most of the VTEs because it's a very nice study done by Jacobson in which again he showed that the high risk of postpartum thrombosis is extended to the extended period and second week as higher than the first week and significantly it reduces after six weeks but persists up to three months. Next one, please. Uh, the same, this is now very interesting uh, data on the highest risk in VTE is the postpartum period. Please make sure that all postpartum patients are assessed and they are given appropriate thromboprophylaxis, which is very important to prevent them to develop the DVT, which can land up in pulmonary embolism. Next one, please. And this is the increase again, whether the patients who had a singleton pregnancy or twins, and this has been done by the in vitro fertilization techniques. And what it is, yes, singleton is associated with increase in the risk of VTE, but the top graph is if they are having even the triplets or twins, the risk is much, much higher in comparison to the uh, spontaneous pregnancy. So VT incidence was significantly increased in pregnancies after IVF, especially if they have a uh, first trimester and in the first six weeks of postpartum, especially so if they are multiple pregnancies. Next one, please. So what should be done for prevention and management? Next slide. Uh, one of the simplest rule is left. That is three objective variables. If a patient has the risk of having VT is almost 58.3%. What that means, left is standing for left symptoms in the left leg, having a calf circumference of more than two centimeter difference in the two legs. And if it especially happens in the first trimester, the diagnosis is uh, VT rather than anything else. Next one, please. And again, most of the people are very scared of exposing these mothers to the radiation, thinking that radiation can cause a damage to the mother or damage to the, especially to the baby. And if you take any one of these tests, they are much, much uh, safer. And the max, they are not, none of them is going to the maximum recommended doses, which is five ads. So I don't think anybody will reach to that. Whether you do CTPA or you do ventilation scans or you do perfusion scans, they are much, much lower than the maximum standard dose. Next one, please. And if you suspect anybody having DVT, the standard is, gold standard is venography, but we don't subject anybody to venography. Compression ultrasonography gives you a good, reliable sensitivity and specificity, which is up to 95 to 98%. And what we see the changes are non-compressibility, echogenic material, or you may see normal, loss of normal phasic pattern. And what about, next slide, please. What about pulmonary embolism? The yes, second, we have five more minutes. Okay. Five more minutes. Sure. Shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, and clinical examination will help you, but you need to think of it. And that's where you need to do the further investigations. Next slide, please. Next one. This is what you do. Suspected VTE, you first do the compression ultrasonography, start them on thromboprophylaxis, do the compression ultrasonography. If that is negative, but you have a high suspicion, repeat it again on the day seven. And also, if you think that the patient is having a lot of chest symptoms, please confer, confirm it either by VQE scan or by CTPA. If a patient has a very massive pulmonary embolism in that situation, you can straight away go and do the thrombolysis and we have done it and it doesn't have a, any much of a morbidity. The long-term sequelae are mainly in the form of uh, having uh, post-thrombotic syndrome or you can have chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Next one, please. And this is, what is the score you can use it? This is a Velalta score and it can be used in patients to assess whether they have a post-thrombotic syndrome. And these are very common symptoms, pain, cramps, heaviness, paresthesia, itching, and symptoms, signs are edema, induration, hyperpigmentation, redness, or venous ectasia, or pain on the compression. If anybody has five score out of this, then the person has some thrombotic syndrome, but if it is 15, it's severe thrombotic syndrome. Next one, please. And uh, I think clinically, if they have anybody who has a pulmonary embolism, they can develop 
chronic pulmonary hypertension. And these are the patients who need to have an echo if anybody has, and it does call, uh, influence the quality of life. Next one, please. And what are the major agents you can use? Low molecular weight heparin is the drug of choice. It's predictable, reliable. You don't need to do any tests. It allows you daily dosing, reducing the risk of bleeding, uh, heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, osteoporosis, and allergic reactions in comparison to the um, conventional heparin, which we used to use previously. What are the other medications which can? Aspirin is not a thromboprophylaxis medications. The other medications, next one, please, which can be used is um, Danaproid or uh, Danaproid or Fondoparinax. The only problem is they have a very long life. We don't give oral uh, and uh, antitana inhibitors like rivaroxaban, apaxaban during pregnancy. They are not um, used during pregnancy because we don't have data on them. Next one, please. And these are the standard doses. I think all the hospitals have the protocols in their hospital. What should be the dose we should be given depending on the weight of the patient. Next one, please. Breastfeeding, absolutely safe with warfarin, with unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin and anaproid. We need to only give alternative anticoagulants if a patient needs fondoparinox or oral direct thrombin and factor 10 inhibitors. Low dose aspirin if a patient is on is absolutely safe during pregnancy, during pregnancy and lactation. Next one, please. Thrombolysis in pregnancy, we have used it and we are very comfortable in using it if it is needed because it's a life-saving and you can have two types, which is systematic, systemic and catheter-directed. Catheter-directed are usually used when there is an occlusive thrombosis because systemic may not work there. Next one, please. IV filters not used much in pregnancy because the experience with them is very limited and they undergo angulation and distortion during pregnancy or they may undergo thrombosis of the filter. So it's sometimes a very difficult decision. If it is to be used, it has to be multidisciplinary uh, management. Next one. Patients, again, are ignored because this is a very stud good study which was published by King's College, and this was, does it have a negative impact on the experience of the women? The reason being, yes, what they said, there were challenges in establishing the diagnosis. Uh, dealing with diagnosis was a problem. Once it was diagnosed, they couldn't cope up with the treatment because of the daily injections, and they had a fear of the future. And what we need to improve the uh, experience of the women is that we should improve the communication and information and we should use a proper diagnostic and treatment pathways and we should Im improve the awareness of this condition among the public. Next one, please. Uh, COVID-19 recommendations already has been said about it. I just will cover what Embrace in May 2020 published. They said COVID-19 should be considered as an additional risk factor and should be uh, prompting reassessment. If they are confirmed or suspected COVID-19, they should receive prophylactic low molecular weight heparin. Severe complication of COVID-19, uh, appropriate dosing should be discussed in MDT. Any patient who comes with a severe COVID-19 infection, these are the patients where you have to give them not the prophylactic, but a full therapeutic doses because there is a risk of developing very extensive thrombosis in these patients, especially in the lungs. Next one, please. So hospitalized, if they are hospitalized, you should continue during the period of thrombo uh, when they, they are in the hospital and continue for at least 10 days after the discharge. In some women, you might need to even give an extended period up to six weeks of postpartum. And we did give to some of the patients who were very, very unwell and were in ICU. Next one, please. So these are some take home messages that prevention and diagnosis and treatment should be priority for all health services. Evidence is that doctors and advice may find some of the uh, risk assessment scores very cumbersome and difficult. So we should start developing very simple tools and on an IT basis and that can be reproducible because it's same what they will be using. And that's electronic VT assessment, which we have introduced in the hospital is very easy and also it is consistent. Next one, please. 
audits should be very important, not only to see whether they have been risk assessment has been done, but very important, is it appropriate? And again, if they had risk factors, did they get the appropriate prophylaxis or treatment if required? And women diagnosed with pregnancy associated VTE, the management has to be multidisciplinary because that they need not only during, and there should be a care plan for pregnancy, labor, delivery, and the postpartum period, which is drafted by the multidisciplinary team. Next one, please. I think that's last. So suspected DVT, please don't uh, leave them without diagnosis. So imaging is extremely safe to do it. And perfusion scintography or CTPA is absolutely safe, has a very high sensitivity and specificity, which can go up to 100%. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Next one. Thank you, Dr. Salima. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will uh, give the screen. I hope uh, Dr. Girija and Dr. Huda are ready. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Girija, who is uh, a senior cons uh, senior specialist from uh, SKU Hospital, and she is going to present. Uh, we are going to present. In fact, here and this uh, is about two studies done in Oman on ectopic pregnancy. Dr. Agrija is going to present about the role of DA4 HCG as an early predictor of success after methotrexate therapy for ectopic pregnancy. Uh, studies done on ectopic pregnancy in Oman. While Dr. Huda, who is an ex resident, uh, welcome Huda. It's nice to see you after a long time. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, the fertility outcome after uh, treatment of ectopic pregnancy with the uh, two methods. Uh, Dr. Ahuda Al-Amri, she is a specialist in uh, Suhar Hospital. Most welcome. Each of you will go, going to get about 10 minutes. Uh, two minutes before the end of the each one, I will uh, remind you. Dr. Agarja, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Rehma. Uh, good evening, everybody. I would like to thank uh, OSOG and also Oman Fertility and Endoscopy Group for giving me an opportunity to present my study data in this webinar. Um, I want to share the screen. Okay. Um, initially, this study was started as a departmental audit in our uh, department, which was presented in the Medical Audit Committee in the year uh, 2016. Uh, this study was for a period of two years, which we analyzed the data from the year January 2012 to December 2013, that is around two years. Uh, the, we included all the ectopic pregnancies which were diagnosed during this period and the diagnosis was based on a standard set criteria of clinical, sonological and biochemical diagnosis. So this amounts to the in incidence of around 1.52%, like around 15 per thousand, which is almost in par with the MOS data which we heard in, by, the, uh, by Dr. Fatma uh, presentation. Uh, we chose this topic for the audit committee, audit uh, presentation in the audit, because this is ectopic pregnancy is something that we all learned. This is a very high risk in, in, in terms of its future fertility, fatalities and catastrophes, that it is mortalities, morbidities, and also has been increasing in increasing in volume over the last decade because of increasing in assisted reproduction uh, technologies. During this study period, we could get around 122 cases of the ectopic pregnancies which are diagnosed based on the Sanders state criteria. Uh, among this, 50% of the patients were subjected to medical management and around 40% of them underwent surgical management. Less than 10% of the patients were managed on expectant uh, basis. Dr. Agirja, maybe you can yeah. increase the screen. Ah, okay, sorry. Yes, is good. It, is Thank it okay you. now? Okay. Oh, uh, when we come to the management of uh, which were managed medically, we could we had a treatment success about 60% of the cases which were successful and a failure rate of around 33% of cases which finally ended up with surgical management and very, very small fraction of patients were lost for follow-up. 
uh, among the surgical patients, like whom we had like 40% of the patients, around 63% uh, of the patients were managed by laparoscopically and around 37 patients were managed by laparotomy. So this was what we actually we presented in the audit committee. Now I am going to the study that which we published in the European Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Biology in the year June 2017. Uh, I would like to give a little background uh, uh, why we chose why we chose to analyze the day four beta SCG. As all of us know that uh, what we are following is the uh, the protocol, conventional protocol, which is proposed by Stowall et al. Way back in 18, uh, 1989, he proposed the first uh, uh, injection of methotrexate for the treatment of ectopic pregnancies, which was later published in 1991 in the Lancet. This was a very landmark uh, achievement in the management of ectopic pregnancy, which shifted from actually surgical to medical. So. Uh, the only drawback of this protocol was one has to wait for seven days, like because we are assessing the day four beta HC, day four and day seven beta HCG to assess the treatment success. So we have to wait for seven long days to get the first clue about the treatment success or the failure. So uh, it's this is the time period that you know things can go wrong and this also causes an economic and a psychological burden for the woman. So we tried to see, is there any, the day, the change in the levels of uh, beta HCG, serum beta HCG levels between day zero and day four, whether it has any prognostic value and if it has, uh, how to quantify this change. The advantages of early prediction, what we noted is it definitely gives an early reassurance to the treating clinician and also to the patient. And also we can decide for the subsequent management of either methotrexate or recourse to surgery at an earlier date. And also, as I said, a lot of you know, financial and psychological burden of waiting for the patient. So this was the main objective of the study. We wanted to validate the change in the serum beta SCG levels between zero or day zero and day four, and to quantify the change if there is any difference. Uh, this was a retrospective study, which I already mentioned. Although we had 60 cases of medically managed ectopic pregnancies during this study period, but because of our strict exclusion criteria where we had to exclude the non-tubal ectopic pregnancies and those who are lost for follow-up, we could get only 48 cases for analysis. Uh, all these patients were managed on a single dose methotrexate protocol and we defined treatment success as normalization of beta HCG, serum beta HCG levels without recourse to subsequent methotrexate, doses of methotrexate or surgery. Uh, so after collecting the data, we calculated HCG index for each patient which means the percentage change in the beta HCG levels between day zero and day four. Instead of what we are doing conventional, it's day four and day seven, we calculated the HCG index between zero and four. After this, we analyzed data analysis was done using an SPSS statistics 2014. And after this, the uh, ROC curve was plotted, receiver operator characteristic curve was plotted to get the best cutoff levels for the HCG index. Here we use the bootstrap method uh, uh, using R software to get the robust confidence intervals of 95. Because our sample size was small, only 48 cases, we had to do a bootstrap. It's a method of resampling technique where we repeatedly uh, randomly resample the same uh, small sample to get uh, avoid the biases and to get a good confidence intervals. And this is the ROC curve. And these are the results we uh, we got at the end of our analysis. We found out that those women who had the decline in the beta HCG on day four compared to day zero, they had almost 81% success rate with methotrexate. On the contrary, those women who had actually rise beta HCG on day four, they had only 30% success rates. And this p-value was really statistically significant. And we also noted one more uh, 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 finding here. Those women uh, who de declined their beta HCG by 10% or more on day four compared to the day zero had 81% treatment success with 77% sensitivity and 81% specificity. 
so we would like we would like to conclude with the conclusion of the studies is that decline in day 4 beta hcg is a reliable biomarker for the methotrexate treatment success decline of more than 10% predicts the good success treatment success and this decline on day 4 beta hcg has a potential to triage patients sooner not only sooner but also better for a better success speed treatment success and also we may have to modify the treatment the current clinical guidelines for the routine clinical practice in the future these are my references thank you thank you for your patient hearing thank you very much uh, dr agirje you are really in time and uh, this very interesting study uh, now the dr ahuda Dr. Ahude, you are with us? Yes, I'm with you. You can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but we... Uh, but, uh, uh, Girija, I think you need to, yeah, yeah. to yeah. end your sharing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it obvious? Yes, just make the screen um, more. Okay. Like you like more. Just a second. No, it's slideshow. Ah, slideshow you want? Okay. Yeah. To yes. be big. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Mariam and us for inviting me for this interesting topic. Uh, I'm so honored to share it with my seniors, whom I'm so grateful to, and nice to see you all again. I will present uh, a research I have done during my residency. Uh, it is about the fertility outcome after the treatment of ectopic using two different methods. Uh, I think I'll skip the introduction since Dr. Naama talked in detail about the ectopic's prevalence and all, and uh, the gold standard treatment which is used. And uh, like, uh, just to conclude that, in addition to saving patient life, uh, we should also think about the, their fertility, uh, future fertility, and also how we can limit the risk of uh, recurrence of ectopic pregnancy. So the objective of this study was to compare the subsequent fertility and risk of recurrence, uh, just, and risk of recurrence of ectopic pregnancy in women who had ectopic pregnancy according to the treatment they received. So we have two groups. One group received medical treatment. The other group. Uh, receive surgical treatment. This includes salbingectomy, salbingostomy. We didn't differentiate in this study. And to see uh, whom had better fertility outcome and whom had a uh, lower recurrence rate of ectopic. Uh, it was a retrospective cohort study. Uh, the inclusion criteria was all Omani who had confirmed ectopic pregnancy. From those, we had to exclude uh, all those who had prior history of ectopic pregnancy, women who were using, uh, using contraceptive method after the diagnosis of first ectopic, and those who had IVF conception. Uh, so it was, uh, as I said, a retrospective cohort study. It was between January 2011 and December 2015. Uh, it, it, we obtained a total of 135 patients who fitted the criteria and those who were admitted in Royal Hospital. Uh, the distribution was among those 77 patients received medical treatment, while 58 patients uh, received surgical treatment. And this uh, include both the conservative surgical and radical surgical uh, management. The main outcome, which I will mention here, is the uh, first uh, intrauterine pregnancy that recorded in both group and the recurrence of ectopic pregnancy. So uh, we retrospectively reviewed the patient who had confirmed tubal pregnancy and who was admitted in Royal Hospital. The choice of management were surgical, as I said, or medical. And uh, we went with the single dose cases only. Those who had to receive the second dose were excluded from this study. And the decision was based on uh, the local hospital protocol uh, of using methotrexate and also patient clinical uh, condition. Uh, so we excluded those who had, I said already, prior history of ectopic pregnancy or those who uh, didn't uh, report seeking pregnancy during the follow-up and uh, those who had uh, like uh, IVF uh, conception, like uh, assisted reproductive technique, and it was not spontaneous conception. 
total of 150 patients were obtained, 15 were excluded because uh, there was no follow-up, like we lost to trace those patients. Uh, so finally, we analyzed a data of 135 patients, including 77 in medical group and 58 in uh, surgical group. This was the standard case report form uh, in which we collected the data of the patient. This includes the sociodemographic uh, data, uh, the number, weight, uh, height, and age, then their uh, uh, reproduct like uh, uh, gynecological and reproductive history. And the, the last part was which type of a treatment they received uh, during that diagnosis of ectopic, either medical or surgical. Uh, so the fertility study, uh, st we studied all the intrauterine pregnancy uh, that followed the first ectopic pregnancy, regardless of the outcome, like uh, is it term uh, was successful term pregnancy or miscarriages? We didn't include that. It has to be just intrauterine pregnancy. And the uh, result was presented as mean standard uh, by standard deviation, and we use a uh, chi-square for qualitative data where we consider the B value of less than 0 0.05 as significant uh, like, uh, outcome. Uh, SBSS was used to analyze the data. So in short, the result and so as I said, the initial 150 uh, patient, we went like uh, we from those who fit the criteria was 135 patient. And uh, uh, if we compare the clinical character of those patients in surgical and medical group, they were almost similar, like no significant difference between two groups regarding age, gestational age, variety, uh, size of the mass, or uh, level of beta SCG at time of treatment. And uh, um, one of the doctors mentioned that one of the risk factors is advanced maternal age. But what we noticed here is most of our patients tend to be in the lower, actually, like uh, uh, younger than to be in more advanced group. So in conclusion, out of the 135 patients, 51 become pregnant in one year follow up after the ectopic pregnancy. And from those 40, uh, like 31 was from the medical group, which is by 40%, uh, 40%. And 15 was from surgical group, uh, which was like by 25.9% from those who had uh, surgical management. Uh, and, uh, but um, I will just show that here, this is better. So uh, as you can see, uh, there was no significant difference in both the intrauterine pregnancy and the recurrence ectopic pregnancy. So in medical group, it was uh, like 40% uh, uh, become pregnant uh, after one year of treatment while surgical group 25%, recurrence was four in the medical group and two in the surgical group. And uh, after analyzing those data, there was no significant difference between the two. So we can't just conclude, the result of the study show that medical management of ectopic pregnancy with methotrexate lead to future fertility outcome that are comparable to those after salpingectomy. And this include both, as I said, we didn't go in detail between the either radical surgery or conservative surgery. And, uh, but even though there was no significant difference in two groups, the rate of subsequent intrauterine pregnancy, it tend to be higher in a group which received the medical treatment. Regarding the recurrence of ectopic pregnancy, there was no difference between two groups. Actually, this is important because if like when dealing with patient, the most first question they will ask Will be I pregnant again, or what is my fertility rate next? So the over uh, so in literature review also it shows same actually so there was no difference either in intrauterine pregnancy or recurrence in both groups, and most likely the cause of ectopic pregnancy is associated with the tubal disease factor rather than the method of a treatment. So in conclusion, the major finding is that uh, is to compare two group in same setting, which was most of study compared like uh, in different settings. And that uh, in one year evaluate uh, the commutative rate, the recurrence is same in both a group. But if it is possible, then conservative management would be preferable than surgical, like in patient who is fitting the criteria for that. Uh, here is some uh, topics which discuss same, like from literature review, and this uh, Dittmeyer, one of the randomized controls, which Dr. Naama uh, mentioned already in details, which showed same actually, that there was no significant difference either in intrauterine pregnancy or recurrence rate in uh, ectopic pregnancy. And that's why my reference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahudeh. Thank you very much. Um, very nice presentation. 
ختامها مسك ان شاء الله now we will end up our uh, scientific session for today for this afternoon by listening to our دكتوره مريم yes okay so to listening to دكتوره مريم uh, about the gathering momentum to improve surgical management of women with uh, tubal ectopic pregnancy um, Dr. Maryam Ghaniya on the tarif. She is a senior consultant in SQH Hospital. In SQ Hospital, she's uh, she's really dynamic, and she's the one who make this group uh, today as it is. Uh, Dr. Maryam, the screen is yours. Larhman Rahim. Slide show. Slide show. Slide show. Sure. I think part of my screen is covered, so. Down, down, Dictor, I can see it down. I can see it, but I need to move it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you mean, okay. You mean it, oh, that mouse is uh, really troubling you, look like, yeah? Yeah, there. Yes. No, yeah. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I'm really thrilled about um, the nice gathering that we succeeded in, in doing by um, having all these experts um, with us. Um, really, um, it's, it's actually a privilege to be um, among the, blue, uh, the group who's involved today. Um, Mariam, is the, your video is open or you meant to be closed? No, it's supposed to be open. Yeah, any, uh... Okay, sorry. That's... Oh, yeah, okay. nice. I, I tried to make my talk and is not about the group as much as the, the objective of the group. Um, and the objective of the group is um, the laparoscopic management of ectopic pregnancy for every woman anywhere at any time in Oman should be a goal, not a dream. And I, I just put some information on why are we adopting such a notion? Why? Are we putting uh, such um, uh, such a uh, such a goal or an objective? Um, of course, uh, this is يعني, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we are under OSOG, the Oman Society of Obstetric and Gynecology, and the the official name of the group is the Oman Fertility and Gynae Endoscopy Group. And this is our logo. Actually, it is the first time appearing. Um, uh, يعني, كده, this is nice and clear. Uh, and it, it gives like a, a very um, a very positive feel that we are moving forward um, in this. Um, so in my talk, I will just um, highlight uh, the momentum that we are trying to develop and how we are developing that momentum. And um, for that goal that we decided we are going to pursue, what are the challenges um, that we might be facing or we are already facing um, in achieving? just to be prepared. So um, as I have mentioned, that is our objective is for all women with ectopic pregnancy. Uh, and we mean the 90% of the ectopic pregnancies because as you have seen throughout the session that um, uh, there are uh, different uh, types of ectopic pregnancies. We are highlighting the tubal uh, because it is the most common uh, type of the ectopics that we are uh, aiming for. So laparoscopic management for women with a tubal ectopic pregnancy uh, anywhere in Oman at any time. Who is to do that? Who will perform the surgery the laparosco laparoscopically anywhere, anytime? That would be the obstetrician gynecologist in Oman. So the group is not gonna do the work. It's actually our colleagues um, will be uh, doing this uh, work and will try to have them on board and try to make sure that uh, this goal is actually worth achieving. So one of our visions is that um, to make it available for all women in Oman to receive the standards of care in fertility management and gynecologic surgery. And if we want the standard of care, then we should highlight what are the standards of care and try to uh, follow them wherever they are. Um, the Oman Fertility and Gyne Endoscopy Group Management uh, is actually a group of obstetrician gynecologists in Oman 
uh, whom, as you can see from the names, they are very senior colleagues in the specialities uh, related to women health. And I really thank them for agreeing to be on board and doing the work that is needed for this. Because as you can see, this is a voluntary work. It is not paid. It is not being mandated by anything. Each of us can be just sitting in their own hospital, minding their own business. But these are people with high uh, visions and high um, energies to achieve the better. And I really thank them all for being on board. Dr. Thraya Rawahi, Dr. Khalsa al and of course, Dr. Rahm al Ghabshi, Dr. Wabh al Ghafri, and Dr. Um, uh, Huda al Ghaiti. So all of your, uh, all of you colleagues and girls, yeah, you are dear friends and uh, thank you very much for being on board and doing the hard work. Um, always I've been asked, what are the benefits of being a member in the group? As you have seen, um, we are not, we are not having any personal benefits. We are actually volunteering to do work. So whoever wants to do more work is more was, uh, is uh, yani very welcome to be on board. So when you become a member in the group, you declare your interest into the objectives of the group, which I hope they all are agreeable for everybody. You declare your willingness to contribute in achieving the mission of the group. As we have said, we are wanting to have the standard of care for all Omani women anywhere in Oman at any time. And I think that is a very, um, hopefully, ag agreeable um, vision uh, to everybody. To When you become a member, you actually uh, uh, reserve a spot into the history of the gynecology, uh, uh, gynecologic women health in Oman, because, um, because you will be contributing and doing work. And uh, the only small thing that we might be helping with is that you get a priority for sharing knowledge and educational activities conducted by the group, uh, like workshop or, or training courses compared to people who are not members. If there is, um, if there is yeah, I need too much uh, competition on those uh, uh, activities. But otherwise, as you can see, you are doing more work than actually receiving benefits from the group. So why have we identified this goal for the, um, to be achieved? As you have seen, and I'm very glad that I am at the end of a spectrum after a few talks that actually highlighted the importance of ectopic pregnancy. We know now that it is important because ectopic pregnancy is important because it is a big contributor to some of the morbidities and maybe mortalities in women health. It is also important because they are almost about, um, from what I gathered from Dr. Huda and Dr. Girija's presentation, there is almost 40 to 50% of women with ectopic pregnancy, they receive surgical intervention. So what type of surgery are we offering to these women? So it's a, a big chunk of women with ectopic pregnancy. And so this highlights the importance. Also, Dr. Naama touched on the importance in related to fertility uh, and the best uh, way to uh, help these women who are trying to um, get pregnant in the future and decrease the risk of recurrent ectopic pregnancy. So all these points highlight uh, the importance of this goal. And that is why um, I'm, I think I'm just going to add a little bit on the importance from some aspects that haven't been touched um, uh, around in, in terms of ectopic pregnancy. And as you have seen from uh, Dr. Fatma's uh, presentation that we have lots of the unknowns about ectopic pregnancy in terms of the numbers that we are gathering. There are um, deficiency in uh, actually grasping or getting all the numbers of early pregnancy, including ectopic pregnancy from all health institutions in Oman, not only those ones that belongs to Ministry of Health. So because of all these factors, I think this goal um, is important to pursue. One, another important is that it belongs to our big uh, vision, which is it is laparoscopic surgery is a gold standard for surgical management of women with ectopic pregnancy. And as you have seen, this have been declared in 2002. So that is 20 years ago that we know laparoscopic uh, approach uh, is the standard uh, surgical approach uh, that is recommended. The gold standard was the standard of care and this have been reiterated in all subsequent guidelines that uh, uh, discuss the management of ectopic, uh, surg um, management, uh, surgical management of ectopic pregnancy. 
Also, it is important because it has been acknowledged, it is not an issue of women's health. It is an issue of public health. It is an important subject that been, uh, yani the literature since 1993, been declared that this subject is important and it is important at the level of the public health, not only at women and women only in reproductive age groups. So this, this subject is really important and needs to be looked into. This is a slide, um, I think everybody is aware about the benefits of laparoscopic uh, um, surgery. I'm just amalgamating all of them in one slide and trying to uh, refresh our minds because sometimes with all the hustles and bustles that we have at work, sometimes we forget how important laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopic approach is. Uh, laparoscopy is a diagnostic and therapeutic approach. It is less, uh, there is a less intraoperative blood loss because there is less amount of tissue damage that you are achieving uh, during access. There is a less de novo adhesion formation and that is important for the future fertility of women. It, um, it has, um, women needs lower analgesics um, uh, amount and dosage uh, because it is less painful. There is a decreased hospitalization uh, duration uh, uh, post-operatively. There is a shorter post-operative recovery. And there is, of course, for women, important not to have a big scar in her tummy. So if it, if it is that good and useful, why we are not doing it for all women? Uh, the main drawbacks or the um, difficulties with it, it is the surgical training that is required for physicians to achieve uh, proficiency. It needs more um, costly, uh, complex equipment, especially at the start, um, uh, as a foundation to um, have the uh, laparoscopic services. It increases the physical demand on the surgeon because um, I'm sure uh, all of you are aware of the ergonomic and the other difficulties that surgeons might have been facing. And there is a possibility of increased operative time in the initial stages before the surgeons uh, achieve a proficiency. Um, let's look, I, I chose to look into the money part, uh, what is called cost benefit and cost effectiveness, because now with the financial crisis and cutting uh, costs everywhere, this becomes important to talk about because most people remember about laparoscopy that it's expensive and it needs lots of money. There is a principle called cost benefit, which is a cost of a procedure compared with its calculated uh, um, um, ben cost benefit uh, uh, of its benefit uh, yani calculated in money terms. Cost effectiveness is the cost of uh, the procedure compared with its benefit, with cost and benefits expressed usually in terms of life saved or disability avoided, decreased morbidity or other non-money uh, related uh, uh, objectives. So if we put all those in perspective, then we, um, uh, I just want you to have a mental note of how common is ectopic pregnancy. And I think um, our um, my previous uh, colleagues spoke about, about different numbers quoted from different sources. But what we actually want to know is our true number uh, uh, in Oman, which hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, we, uh, we will get. So there is an in-hospital cost benefit in laparoscopy. Uh, why is that? Because there is 70 to 90% reduction in the hospitalization duration from 12 hours to two days, whereas it takes about three to five days for a laparotomy. There is decreased hospitalization time, increase that means there is increased bed availability for other uh, causes uh, or for, for other patients. And there is decreased complication of admission. As you have seen from Dr. Salim Awani, there is a direct relationship between the duration of admission and the risk of DVT. This is just a simple benefit, uh, not related even to money. It's related to saving lives. Of course, the shorter the time the patient stays in the hospital, there is uh, decreased uh, nursing care that they uh, need. There is the uh, decreased use of medications, including analgesia and thromboprophylaxis, and there is uh, decreased use of supplies. Uh, so in, uh, it is proven that the hospital cost in U.S. 
uh, very early when laparoscopy was started, so things are more expensive that time, there is a, a randomized uh, prospective study noted that there is an average of 1,500 US dollar being saved uh, on charges and patient treatment for ectopic if, if they have done a laparoscopy compared to a laparotomy. 1,500 bar case might be too little bit on the higher side for Oman because the uh, physicians uh, and surgeons uh, and also nursing staff are not paid in the same level. So still we will save money for sure if we did uh, cost saving or cost effectiveness, but maybe less than uh, what is being projected for uh, US. So there is saving and cost uh, effectiveness in hospital. After discharge, there is also cost, uh, cost benefits because the patient takes less time to return to normal activity after laparoscopy. In laparotomy, they take an average of about uh, 25 days, whereas in laparoscopy, they take around eight, uh, like a week to eight days to actually go to their baseline activities after uh, discharge. Also, there is a lost income to the patient if she is working, or there is a loss of income to her employer while she has a sick leave of those 25 to 30 days. Uh, and actually, um, I should mention that most patients in Oman after laparotomy, as far as I know, they get uh, the sick leave of four weeks. So that is close to the number that is being quoted around 25 to 30, um, around the 25 to 30 days, which is about uh, a month. There is the cost of attending to the patient fully to function and return to the work post operatively. And there is, since of these, this, these women are in reproductive age, there are many of them have uh, kids who might also need care while they are sick at home. And added to all is the reduction in the patient stress and inconvenience having a, um, a surgical wound, wherever it's possible to uh, avoid. So if it is mandated as a standard of care, if it is good for patients and it is good for healthcare system, why we are still not doing laparoscopy everywhere in Oman all the time and any, everywhere and all the time? Why? Because as we have mentioned, there are barriers that will include the logistics and equipment that is required, the surgical skills that is required and a suitable patient that is needed. And this um, issue of having barriers in uh, conducting or adopting laparoscopy as an approach to manage, uh, uh, to manage uh, uh, surgical cases is not uh, unique to Oman or to the Middle East, it's actually everywhere, including high income countries like UK, uh, sorry, uh, like uh, US. Um, in, and this is not all. U.S. has an issue. This is, a, this is um, um, an American uh, uh, article discussing barriers to, for adoption of laparoscopic surgery in 2015. And so they still has issues of trying to adopt surgery everywhere, laparoscopic uh, surgery everywhere. Um, another article is talking about those barriers or similar barriers in uh, lower and middle uh, income countries. So rich countries and poor countries have problems conducting laparoscopy and adopting laparoscopic approach. And why is that? Because there are lots of barriers, including clinical barriers, systemic and economic barriers. I'd like to talk about something called the invisible barrier. The invisible barrier is something that I have heard uh, quite a bit about, uh, um, people not believing that laparoscopy is actually important. And why is that? Because they argue that laparoscopy is not a priority as a healthcare battle, uh, as the healthcare is battling lots of other issues. And so focusing on laparoscopy distract attention from urgent basic needs. So my answer to that is that healthcare always battles different issues at the same time. It's never one thing at a time. And it is um, already we had put evidence that whether it is health related issues or money related issues that laparoscopy is actually worth thinking and worth thinking it is important. The cost saving um, is a mechanism for the, it is a cost saving mechanism on the long run. It decreases morbidity, especially nowadays we have non-communicable diseases and increasing obesity. So a surgical wound has lots of complications 
and uh, including the infective complications, and that is incre uh, including increased antimicrobial resistance. So there is decrease also ad abdominal adhesions and decrease to decrease the morbidity and decrease the future probability of intestinal obstruction and other adhesions related morbidities, including a recurrent ectopic pregnancy. So I tried to put a little bit of things that might um, highlight or be identified um, my, in my humble opinion as obstacles or things uh, worth um, related to. So in terms of financial resources, there are issues of purchasing the frontline laparoscopic equipment cost. There is uh, sourcing consumables um, for the future. And for surgical skills issues, either the surgical skills are not available, and when they are available, they are either limited in number or limited in time availability. So when talking about systemic issues, issues that are affecting or acting as barriers to adopting laparoscopy is that one of the things is fragmented healthcare systems, where there is no unified national plans uh, and even if they are national plans, they are not implemented or mandated at all levels. There is budget uh, uh, institutional or sector based rather than the global health uh, care budget. So we find that the budget of Ministry of Health and the, then the budget of hospitals and then in the hospitals, there are budgets um, of departments and sections. So there are lots of fragmentation that makes um, bullying or um, be having the resources dynamics makes it uh, difficult. Also, our budget structure is annual base most of the time, and we know that the laparoscopy uh, cost effectiveness, it does not come in the first year. In the first year, still, you will not regenerate revenue or compensate uh, for the cost of the uh, foundational units of a laparoscopy. The cost saving is not regularly monitored or audited to decide budget planning or practice changing in the government institutions. And this is not true only for government institutions, even for private institutions. We don't calculate for the future. We calculate only for the year. And, and that is, um, and that is um, we, th we think that is not, uh, uh, doesn't give the laparoscopic approach the, the justice. The issue of insufficient supply chain of laparoscopic consumables uh, because either there is centralization of requests uh, or how to actually obtain your equipment. There is a multi-level approvals that you need and sometimes the system is really inflexible to, um, uh, to fulfill your needs. Um, other resources related issue is that it is the lack of experts advisors with the technical expertise who might advise a hospital or a department who wants to purchase an endoscopic unit. And actually we have went through this, I think every hospital who wanted to purchase laparoscopy went through this hassle of actually they don't have a very um, yani clear guide or somebody to help them uh, to tell them which equipment is better than what and what are what is the drawback it's more depends on companies uh, advertising for for, own, for their own systems and it takes lots of effort from the decision makers to decide which one they are going to go for because also there are future impl uh, implications for that like like post sale services and the uh, supply chain consumables also there is lack of nursing uh, technical expertise or adequate biochemical depart, uh, uh, biomedical department support when purchasing a new equipment, which puts lots of burden on the surgeon. We have seen that when we request an equipment, you will be the one deciding what is the equipment, how you are going to operate it, and how you are going to help uh, people uh, service it and look for it, which is outside the scope of what a surgeon should focus, uh, should focus on. So these are some of the um, issues. Other issues are there is segregation of resources to department in some of the hospitals. There will be a laparoscopic uh, tower for surgeons and there is a laparoscopic tower for ob -GYN. I'm not saying this is wrong. As long as people actually can share resources and um, work with each other, this might be good or, or bad, depends on the local setting. In private sector, insurance companies does not always appreciate the endoscopic approach in the financial cover. And I have seen that after I joined the private uh, sector uh, as part time, there are lots of um, uh, forth and back into deciding that they are gonna cover this patient for this procedure on this approach. 
Also, in private sector, when a patient is offered a cheaper laparotomy option compared to a more expensive laparoscopic one, they will go for the cheaper approach. Because also they don't see the future benefit. They don't calculate how much she will be, she will be away from home how, uh, or away from the hospital, or away from work, difficulty in uh, taking care of her kids. Those calculations does not usually come to mind at, on the spot. There is also a systemic bias. Many institutional leadership does not prioritize women health as important, and many are not aware of the role of laparoscopy in women's health. And I think this is changing as the leadership actually in the hospitals um, becoming more aware and they are more involved in the, um, in the healthcare uh, system um, as a whole. There are some, what we call it, clinical local factors. They're, the availability of the operating room uh, for laparoscopic emergency is these cases are competing for the same room for all emergencies during the on-call or even during the working hours, but it is under the umbrella of emergency. So they are competing for the same anesthesia team who covers emergencies, the same OT staff, uh, nurses, the equipment, that if there is an elective case and they have one tower, then it is the emergency uh, and the emergency uh, case. Um, there is a competition between the two, uh, deciding which one is the priority, which one we should do and things like that. And the actual physical space of the OT. So this puts pressure in direct or indirect pressure on the surgeon to choose the quickest route um, to do the surgery. And if it is a starting surgeon, then we know many of the surgeons, they, they will be slower in laparoscopy rather than laparotomy. And that is indirectly might uh, uh, push the surgeon to decide for a, uh, for a laparotomy. So these are some of the uh, factors uh, uh, that might be uh, playing a role into, the, um, uh, into why we are not adopting uh, surgery, uh, ectopic uh, uh, pregnancy. Uh, sorry, we are not adopting laparoscopy for uh, ectopic pregnancy. In terms of the surgical uh, skills issue, I don't know what is the problem with this thing coming in the front of me, but uh, please, ig uh, please ignore it. Um, so there is, um, in, in terms of availability of skills, there is low intake of residency uh, training. Sometimes there is inadequate training for those who are graduate of the residency program. They are sometimes um, uh, unstable pool of surgeons in some departments because people are leaving, they are migrating, or they are moving to other institutions. There is loss of uh, skills uh, in some of the practicing uh, physicians. That might be somebody who is uh, trained in doing laparoscopy, at least the ones that are the skill set that is needed to treat ectopic pregnancy, but because of subspecialization and being busy with lots of other, of other thing, things, with time they lose that proficiency in laparoscopy. So this is a loss the skill and, and uh, hopefully this is not very common in Oman. There is also lack of certif uh, certification process or a practice audit uh, in our country in terms of women health and laparoscopic uh, practice. So that is why we want the laparoscopic management of ectopic pregnancy everywhere um, uh, and all the time. So is it possible I like to dream, but as I said in my title, I am dealing with this as, an, as a goal, not a dream. Why is that? Because let's look at history. Uh, the first diagnostic laparoscopy in ob department was done in, 19, in the 1980s in the Royal Hospital. And it was, they were doing laparoscopy with just a scope uh, without a camera. So they were through a keyhole, they are looking inside the lady's tummy. So they were able to do that. In 1995, a camera with a new laparoscopic equipment was received and a diagnostic laparoscopy the way we know it now uh, was performed and with uh, some cases of ovarian drilling. In 1996, laparoscopic salbingectomy was performed followed by laparoscopic uh, ovarian cystectomy in the same year. So we have been doing laparoscopy for a while. Um, we know that the ob department in SQUH was um, uh, newer or uh, came to, uh, 
to the existence after Royal Hospital. So they have been uh, doing the lab laparoscopy. Was the first laparoscopy in OB-GYN department was done in 1991. So if we have been doing laparoscopy for this long, I think we can do more. Gynecology laparoscopy have been for, performed in Oman for more than 30 years now, if we calculate the years. And so all what we need to do is just, we need to do more of it and we need to distribute it everywhere. Okay, is that difficult? Hopefully not. So let's see what will be a driving force for changing surgeons' behavior. It's not only actually about the surgeons. As, as we have seen, there are lots of other things um, that um, uh, affect this outcome. Uh, but let's see what might be the driving force. First is inadequate training as a reason will it is a time limited because the training standards are changing and changing in Oman and changing uh, worldwide. There is increasing patients demand and we can see patients are jumping from one hospital to another in the same country or in the same region, uh, region looking for laparoscopic intervention. So patients are aware and they want laparoscopy. Another thing is there is a, um, in the healthcare system management, the holistic approach to- yeah, uh, It's very nice to listen to you, but do you have, uh, you will need more than another, maybe four to five minutes? No, okay. no, I am- So we'll leave some time for the questions. I'm going to write to the audience if there are any, any questions. Thank you. Okay, sure. Victor, go ahead. Yes. So, when it comes to adequate training for laparoscopy, um, because this is one of the things that will be changing, is that uh, we know that um, many of our residents, they graduate either at the level of preceptorship in the operating room where they actually operate with an expert, or they uh, uh, graduate under supervised uh, surgery, which is under mentorship, um, where they are being observed while they are operating. So still many of them, they need that support when they go back to workplace. Uh, and this, um, I'm encouraging all our residents to actually try and when they graduate to be able to do um, laparoscopy only with mentorship rather than perceptorship. Um, so our patients are becoming uh, demanding more for uh, laparoscopy and that is also being facilitated by, by different systems uh, encouraging uh, uh, or providing patient education about the available options for management. In order to receive to achieve the goal, we need lots. We have lots of uh, requirements. One of them is the information. As you have seen, there are lots of things that we don't know about our uh, pool of practicing uh, physicians in Oman in, in obstetric and gynecology. We don't know what is the private. Oh, sorry, we don't know what is the practice setup in many of the healthcare institutions. We don't know what are the factors that actually belong to us in in terms of numbers. So we need information about. Uh, many of things related in order for us to progress. So, so far as a group, we have uh, tried to gather some information. And I think this, um, this webinar have highlighted the need for some more information. Also, uh, we um, have prepared an, uh, some educational material for, in, uh, for patients in Arabic and English. And I thank Dr. Abir Al-Hadrami actually for putting the effort into achieving that. And that can be disseminated through the also communication uh, channels. Uh, we are, uh, inshallah soon, we'll be reaching for HODs and also our obstetrician gynecologist in Oman, uh, surveying their uh, laparoscopic services and what might be identified as barriers and how we can uh, help them to facilitate communication. So the group is hoping to help uh, the country through education, research and training. And we, we need to actually facilitate cultural change. And uh, we need to improve awareness, educate patients, identify our needs, uh, improve our training, gather more information and develop partnership with official institutions. Uh, and I really thank the Women and Child Health Department in the Ministry of Health for being on board and being open for the communication and the support that have been provided Dr. Jamila and Dr. Fatma and their group. So they are really an asset um, to facilitate the forward for this uh, goal. You as an obstetrician gynecologist sharing us, uh, sharing this objective with us and being with us on this webinar, what can you do to achieve this goal starting today? This is use the available educational material for patient education. 
uh, appropriately diagnose and code ectopic pregnancy because if you collect if we collect data then we should know that this is labeled in the system in your electronic uh, monitoring uh, electronic medical record that this is actually an ectopic pregnancy identify opportunity where you can do laparoscopy instead of laparotomy in your own practice develop partnership with other institutions and other departments what we have seen there are some doctors some surgeons actually uh, uh, traveling from one uh, government to another uh, to uh, do like visiting services and help the team there and i think that is a, a, a direction that we should encourage we should also be able to conduct audits this is just a uh, suggestion from my side i'm not saying that everybody should adopt these standards but actually based on the literature uh, uh, labroscopy for ectopic uh, should be around uh, or labrotomy for ectopic should be around only 15 percent of those who need surgical intervention 10 percent of them for those who are hemodynamically unstable and five percent for those who can be converted or technically very difficult to achieve by laparoscopy also you can encourage patients you can see how many of the patients um, uh, according to your own uh, local guidelines and local protocol how many of them who should be treated um, surgically actually treated medically just because the surgical intervention as a laparoscopy is not available so at the end of this and i hope i hope this webinar have encouraged uh, or uh, shed some light into the importance of ectopic pregnancy in general, not only the laparoscopic intervention. Discussing laparoscopic is, uh, intervention is only um, a door to actually highlight the subject in general. Um, so it should be a standard of care and that have been declared for uh, so many uh, decades now, at least 20 years. It is proven in different care systems to be important and it's cost saving. The gynecology laparoscopy started in Oman around 30 years ago and it should grow and, um, and spread um, in the country. And um, in implementing laparoscopy for all women in Oman anywhere and anytime is achievable goal with the cooperation and uh, uh, help from all uh, healthcare sectors in the country and work is required in order to understand the local barriers and challenges toward improving access to women laparoscopic surgery surgical intervention in Oman and uh, thank you very much all for uh, being with us and thank you uh, Dr. Rahma for being patient uh, with me. Thank you Dr. Maryam. Um, I'm really proud that we did it finally and we were, we were trying to be recognized and uh, I mean we develop ourselves maybe since I think we started since uh, somewhere in May and here we are today that's very good uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, those who are being with us this afternoon we got more than 100 um, uh, participants and I want to thank also the speakers. I'm trying and uh, I could not find any questions um, that need to be answered. Maybe the speakers were very good in uh, uh, really their uh, presentations are so clear and the ideas look like are very clear to everybody. And um, that's it for this afternoon. I want to only to say that uh, it is maybe one of the um, things which the, um, the, um, uh, all the obstetric and gynecologists in Oman need to know that there is a hotline uh, in, for the Minister of Health sharing between the Minister of Health and the WHO and OSOC uh, for the all women in Oman uh, if they have any question regarding any uh, issues with women that they can uh, call uh, this hotline. It is we are uh, there are two consultants answering this uh, hotline. Uh, it is myself and uh, Doctora Tamima. Uh, we are uh, ongoing with this hotline. I think since May or uh, June, somewhere in May between May and June, we started and we're still going on. Uh, we are receiving many calls uh, from those from patients uh, who have any queries regarding their health, their women health, uh, regarding their pregnancy, those who are COVID, and it's look like it's uh, working very well. And uh, I want to thank also all the speakers. If you have any comments, any of the speakers have any comments before we end up? Or uh, Dr. Tamima, if you are around. Um, 
دكتورة فاطمة although you, uh, you scared me about the percentage of ectopic in Oman but I hope because of the, of this, uh, the, the, I feel the figures maybe they are not, uh, not full. I think maybe we need more figures. And I'm sure that the number of those who are registered in early pregnancy, I don't think in Oman, I don't, I'm not sure if the, uh, those, uh, the Omanis, most of them, when I talk to them, the Omanis, they think that they should not register in the beginning of pregnancy. Maybe they come to you in the second trimester. So that's why maybe we have this much of uh, high figure. I'm not sure, يعني. I'm just, uh, because it's really high. Anybody have any comment? Thank you, Dr. Rahma. Can I just maybe yes. have, if I'm allowed to do like a conclusion remarks? It was very nice afternoon and thank you all for contributing and being here until the end. Thank you all the speakers. I'm having, I don't know what's my view, Yani, how do I look this? You look, you look nice as <laughs> usual to me. You look as usual. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. Again, this is really um, a group which has been very active obviously, as Rahma and Mariam have uh, already described. I just wish that like this group that we have subspeciality group now in fertility and uh, in discovic surgery, I want to see other groups forming up in gynae oncology, in urogynecology, maternal fetal medicine, and all other subspecialties in obstetric and gynecology. That's all. And I thank you all for contributing and have a nice evening. Thank you um, very much. I, I, I would like to um, send an open invitation to our colleagues um, uh, from the uh, private healthcare sector uh, uh, because we want to disseminate communication and unfortunately um, because uh, Oman Society of Obstetric and Gynecology um, uh, is like a co collaborative institution. It's uh, it's we need people to approach us, giving us their contacts and their information in order to disseminate some of the, of the information. I encourage all obstetricians, gynecologists in Oman to be a member of Oman Society of Obstetric and Gynecology uh, because this is the way where all related uh, women health issues uh, in the reproductive life and both. Um, is, re, uh, is is going to be disseminated. And uh, it is gaining more momentum because even in um, some institutions like the Oman uh, Medical Speciality Board in encouraging their residents to be associated with the um, uh, speciality societies corresponding to their program because uh, they provide some legal uh, help and protective um, services. So really there are lots of benefits. I really encourage everybody to apply for the membership and uh, not only for the society, but also for the group to be able to do more work, as we have uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, I hope the momentum for managing ectopic pregnancy does not stop by closing your desktop today uh, or taking your headphones off. Uh, please, we really hope that the momentum that we created today continues. Um, we are, um, as a group, and um, yani, as a group and uh, in the country, we are... Um, we are open for suggestions. If there is a way we can help, uh, please approach us. Uh, of course, you know how to get um, through to us. And uh, Zakia is the hidden soldier or the unknown soldier for everybody who has been doing the hard work. Uh, she will be able to co connect you to the right people for, your, um, for whatever you are requiring. So please, please keep the momentum that we created today that I hope it's got created, keep it going. Inshallah ta'ala, we see you in the future, um, in future webinars and occasions. Thank you. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Salima from UAE. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, all. Ma'as salama. Ma'as salama.